Before you uh, started writing about psychedelics, you'd previously written a lot about our kind of engagement with the natural world. Do you see a kind of through line from that work to your work on psychedelics? Yeah, um, I mean, psychedelics are part of our engagement with the natural world. Most of them are produced by plants or fungi, and um, we've been using them for a long time. I'm, I've always been interested in the human plant relationship and the, the symbiosis that goes on or the co-evolution uh, and how we use plants to satisfy various desires. And one of those desires, uh, and one of the most curious is the desire to change consciousness. And whether you're talking about coffee and tea or um, peyote or, uh, you know, I mean, even LSD is basically produced by a fungus, even though it's it has to be derived from that. Um, and I've always found this a very curious thing about us as a species and about the plants who produce it. Um, how incredible is it that a plant can produce a chemical that acts so specifically on a receptor in the, in the human brain that pr to produce a, a substantial change in consciousness? Um, how did that happen? Why did the plant do that? Um, so those questions have been with me for a long time. And in, in, back in um, 2001, I published a book called Botany of Desire, where I specifically looked at the plant-human relationship through this lens of what are the plants doing to change us, even as we're changing them. Um, and I looked at cannabis there as, as the model. And ever since I've been curious about psychedelics. Uh, so when I started hearing about this research a couple of years ago, um, things going on at Johns Hopkins, Imperial College, uh, NYU, I thought, well, this is a chance to get back into that area and, and, and explore this uh, whole phenomenon of consciousness change using using plants and and fungus. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned this kind of idea of co-evolution that you write about in the botany of desire. And I think with psilocybin mushrooms, something I find fascinating is the potential there that there's some kind of co-evolution going on. Uh, you know, as to as to why they kind of have this this lock and key kind of mechanism. You know, to activate these circuits in our brain. Um, and yeah, I was I was kind of. Um, wondering about your thoughts on that, because I was expecting that to maybe be a, a huge part of the book, which it, it wasn't in the end, but do you have any thoughts on the possibility of that? Yeah, I couldn't get a lot of solid information about that. I mean, we definitely have spread psilocybin. Um, it's very easy to spread mushrooms. I mean, you know, I found that when I was uh, mushroom hunting with Paul Stamets. Um, you know, he said at one point that the uh, the indicator species for for uh, psilocybe as your essence is the is the Winnebago, um, the campers, uh, and that you find most of them near where people are parked, and so that's because we're trailing spores behind us whenever we move mushrooms around. Um, but to what extent did the mushroom become? You know, was it selected for its? Um, you know, intensity. We, I, I don't think we know that for sure. Um, you know, it's not like, say, the tomato, you know, which got bigger and redder under our, um, you know, watchful eye. It may be true. Um, certainly, we see that with cannabis, you know, that cannabis, the plant, has had, had such intensive horticulture applied to it that it's you know, modern hybrids are, are substantially different than the, the wild forms of cannabis. But whether you can say that about mushrooms or not, I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, I think they did have a big effect on our species in, in one way or another. I, I'm not sure I, I buy the stoned ape the theory. I've just never been kind of convinced that those kind of changes would find their way into the human genome. I mean, I, I tend to think the impact of psychedelics is more in the realm of cultural evolution I know you can't completely separate the two, but um, I, you know, I'm a, I, I do believe that there are very important cultural memes that have been introduced uh, by this combination of these molecules and human minds. And that every now and then, I mean, that I, the, the term I use in talking about it, or I did in Botany and Desire and in, and in this new book I'm working on, is that um, powerful drugs like psychedelics are a kind of mutagen in the, in the realm of, bi of uh, culture rather than biology. In the same way, radiation is a really disruptive force that leads to mutation, contributes to variation, that every now and then really benefits the species. Um, psychedelics is doing something similar in human minds and 
you know, giving people visions that give them ideas. I mean, who knows, it, you know, if the idea of an afterlife or an unseen world or, or, or the platonic ideal, you know, that there is an ideal version of a cup uh, next to the cup. These, you know, could seem plausible, plausibly psychedelic ideas to me. And um, religion may owe a, a, a huge debt to psychedelics. It's very hard to prove um, because we also do have dreams, of course, you know, without drugs. And, and, and we have those kind of visions, but there is an authority, there is an authority to psychedelic visions that, it, you know, the noetic quality as James called it, uh, speaking of the mystical condition, mystical experience that convinces people these things are real. And you could see how someone would have a kind of mystical experience and be dying to tell everybody about it and would speak about it, uh, you know, as if it were written on stone tablets, you know, it just would have that kind of concreteness. So, um, but, you know, Paul Stamets and others and Terrence McKenna, um, you know, really believed that the influence was, uh, that, it, 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 that the, the mushrooms, consumption of mushrooms on the savannah exerted a, a, a true selective force and contributed to language. Um, and McKenna has this interesting idea that language is a special, case of a synesthesia, which we do know is associated with, um, uh, with psychedelic experience. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I, I just don't understand how it gets into the genome. Yeah, I, I agree that the, the stoned ape theory, you know, the idea that that was the, you know, introducing psilocybin mushrooms into our diet was the thing that made us different to other animals. I, yeah, I agree that I can't quite see how that, how that you happens. Know, I, I looked at this question of what accounts for the explosion in the size of the human brain when I was writing a book called Cooked a few years ago. And there's a more compelling thesis that it was cooked food that actually led to these changes in that when you cook your food, it takes less metabolic energy to digest it. And you're basically externalizing that process in the fire. And, um, and at the same time, you don't need as much intestinal length and you don't need as big a gut uh, so you can you can give energy that used to go to the gut to help you digest difficult food uh, it can go to the brain and um, so that the it's called the cooking hypothesis uh, it was put forward by Richard Wrangham uh, anthropologist at Harvard um, and you know he's done really cool experiments in his lab of feeding animals on cooked food versus not cooked food, and there's just so many more calories that they get when the food is cooked. So um, I find that more persuasive for the the growth of the giant brain. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of romanticism the, in the psychedelic space. Yeah, <laughs> that was the the kind of mainstream uh, the textbook kind of explanation that I was taught when I was studying uh, to be a neuroscientist. That the kind of the idea that fire acts as a kind of external stomach you're kind of pre-breaking it down and then you can just get right. a lot more um energy energy to the brain it's much more efficient yeah and it's not necessarily eating meat because if you eat meat without cooking it you don't get these benefits but it's it's the cooking piece um so anyway you know these are all somewhat just so stories i mean it's very hard to uh, to pin them down yeah i mean when it comes to these kinds of memes that you were talking about are uh, changing our relationship to nature is a big one that comes along with with psychedelics kind of ecological consciousness and for me I, I always found it tempting to link that to the way that you know psilocybin mushrooms tend to thrive in in disturbed ground ground that you know maybe humans have have disturbed and to me it seemed like well I can absolutely imagine evolution stumbling on a trick to rein us in you know as these kinds of primates start to dominate nature it just finds the right kind of the, you know uh chemical key because you know, mushrooms are making chem you know, chemicals all the time and acting on animals whether it's through toxins whatever um yeah and that they just that they are genuinely evolved to have this effect on us but then i spoke with dennis mckenna about about this kind of stuff and and he was emphasizing the the fact that you know these are really ancient molecules that also act on insects and yeah it kind of left me feeling like maybe that's a bit of an anthropocentric view to think it's all about us yeah, I, and you have to be careful of that in all these co-evolutionary arguments. Most of these alkaloids that have such a powerful effect on us began as defense chemicals, 
basically the goal was to keep from being eaten. Um, there's a theory about psilocybin that it's about competition with insects for the same detritus. Um, and that the uh, psilocybin basically, uh, one of the things psilocybin does, and it's true of other alkaloids, is, is ruin your appetite. And um, so if you expose an insect to um, some psilocybin, they're gonna get distracted from sitting down to have a meal. <laughs> and you know, um, a theory I play with in this new book is that if you're in the business of producing defense chemicals to keep from being eaten, you probably don't wanna be lethal um, because if you're lethal, you'll be selecting for resistant members of the pest population. Um, what you, what would be a better strategy is to uh, discombobulate, confuse, intoxicate your pest. If you're an insect and you're intoxicated, you know, you're more likely to have a bird come pick you off, uh, or forget what you're doing. And I tell the story in, um, I think this was in, uh, Botany of Desire, uh, I had a I had a fenced garden, vegetable garden, and in there I kept a, uh, a catnip plant for my cat Frank. And every evening when I went to harvest something for dinner in the summer, he would follow me down into the garden. He loved catnip, but every day I had to remind him where it was. The catnip had gotten him so fucked up that he forgot where it was. <laughs> That's a brilliant strategy on the part of the catnip. <laughs> Yeah. So, so messing with the minds of your predator is a good strategy. Um, and, um, but it began, you know, it probably began with other species than us. And, um, and then we just kind of found it useful. Um, caffeine is an interesting example because it is a defense chemical. It's toxic to certain insects. Um, and also it, it has an allopathic effect. If uh, the soil around some caffeine is very hard for other plants to, to grow in. But then some plants, and this research was only done a couple of years ago, just uh, actually make caffeine in their nectar, which is not where you want a defense chemical. And it turns out they've repurposed caffeine as an attractant and that honeybees really like a little bit of caffeine. And if they get it, they'll remember uh, and be more faithful to the plant that gave it to them and return there more often. So essentially caffeine makes them more effective pollinators as it makes us more effective workers. Um, so the purpose, I, I know we shouldn't use the word purpose when we're talking about evolution, but the, the function of a, of a given thing gets repurposed all the time. And, and that may be true with psychedelics. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important point um, on the caffeine example with the and especially with psychedelics, that the, the trip isn't in the molecule, right? Caffeine isn't inherently stimulating. It's this kind of, I guess, to understand why it has that effect, you have to really look at the network of nature and see where these interactions are happening. And so things can absolutely be repurposed and have completely different effects in, in different, different organisms. 